Hi, everybody. Welcome to our weekly hangout about Bitcoin, fintech, freedom, and much more. I'm your host, Paul Buitink, and my co-host today is uh, Roland de Gooy of Holland's most popular Bitcoin site, bitcoinspot.nl. I'm honored to announce today's guest, the ever-charming Mr. Jeffrey Tucker, Chief Liberty Officer at Liberty.me and author of many books, amongst them his latest, Bit by Bit, How P2P is Free in the World. Our viewers uh, can ask questions using the Q&A tool. Hi, Jeffrey, and great to have you on. That's nice to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. I'm speaking to you from the offices of the Foundation for Economic Education in Atlanta. Okay, that's great. Atlanta is, is quite, quite a town. It's very Bitcoin friendly, I think. There are 400 members of the Bitcoin meetup here in town and many people. I have a, a group I run on Wednesday nights. It meets every Wednesday called Anarchy in Atlanta. And, uh, and many Bitcoiners show up and we talk about peer-to-peer about -peer technology and Bitcoin in particular. This is also the home of BitPay. I don't know if you knew that, but uh, BitPay is here. So uh, lots of Bitcoin startups and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's interesting. BitPay has, uh, of course, the head office in Atlanta, but also has a European office in, in Amsterdam. And we're, of course, Dutch. So there's a connection between Atlanta and Holland uh, just there. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. I didn't know BitPay had offices in, in Holland. That's really, it's, that's in Amsterdam. That's really wonderful. Yeah. It's a great company. I've visited their offices. I co-sponsored a conference with BitPay. Uh, this is a very interesting company, and uh, they've been enormously successful, and still holding on to their principles, which is very unusual <laughs> these days. Exactly. So before we uh, dive into the world of Bitcoin, let's first talk a bit about philosophy and, um, and anarchy, uh, because you identify yourself as an anarchist, right? I do, and, and, and there are many reasons for this. I, first of all, I'm convinced that the state no, makes no contribution whatsoever to making the world a better place. Uh, it doesn't help us in our individual lives, in our families, in our communities, uh, as nations. It does nothing but cause trouble. It lives parasitically off the rest of the population. So, uh, and I think that society without a state has, has all the mechanisms that are necessary to give us what we want. Prosperity, security, um, uh, an, oppor uh, an opportunity for realizing our dreams, all of that comes from the social order and not, not from the state. So I, don't, I think the state was, is, has always been a mistake, essentially. It's one we keep recreating again and again. Uh, but I personally don't believe it has much future. And uh, I think we're entering into an, a world of anarchism, and I think we need to prepare for it by understanding uh, what it means, what anarchist philosophy really is. So what do you think of new states like uh, Lieberland, this new tiny state that was announced a few weeks ago? Um, oh. Do you think that that's a good thing or a bad thing? I, I, it has to be a good thing. I, you know, I think it's a part of a larger puzzle. Um, I do think it's fascinating, this idea of finding a territory in the world that is not ruled by any state and establishing it as a free place. Um, that's, I think, very good. But I still don't think that that's necessary to achieve anarchism. I think what, what's necessary is that we have to make the state obsolete through the growth of technology, peer-to-peer uh, -peer technology that connects people across borders and without the uh, intermediary uh, menace, of intermediating menace of the state itself. So I think we can realize anarchy without having to move to Liberland, is as, as nice as Liberland might be. Although I understand it's not that much bigger than the Vatican, and it's mostly filled with trees and stuff like that, you know, so... It sounds like there's a lot of work to do. Yeah, I, I'm actually organizing a conference in, in Holland in September. Uh, this is actually the first time I talk about it publicly, but uh, the president of uh, Lieberdent has uh, already agreed on, on speaking at that conference uh, because he's going to accept Bitcoin in his new nation. So it's uh, interesting to, to hear more about. I think it's really, really fascinating. I, I hope that, that they'll be left alone by the European community and by the United Nations or the biggest problem of all in the world, the United States. <laughs> but uh, we shall see. Maybe if Liberland doesn't bother anybody else, uh, then uh, nobody will bother Liberland. That's, that's what I'd like to see happen. So, and I think it's really exciting. You know, yeah. uh, there's also other nations. What, what, what country is it that's now offering passports? Um, it's not the Czech Republic. I mean, Estonia with the e-residency? Yeah. Issue? E-residency in Estonia, so that's kind of exciting. It's, it's limited. Uh, actually, they don't offer passports. It's just residency. 
but um, I think it's really exciting, this idea that we're going to break down nation-state attachments, you know. I mean, the nation-state is this weird artifact. It was born in something like maybe the early 16th century, uh, and it gradually got worse and worse and worse, and then became worse of all in the 20th century. Um, but, but it's not a natural state of living. I mean, Europe... In you know in the in the fifteenth century uh, and early sixteenth century, uh, you know there were different names for different countries, but borders were porous. You know you would go across them, and 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 even up through the late nineteenth century, people tended to think of themselves as as Europeans, a citizen of Europe. You know they would travel from here to there. Their names would slightly change based on the language they speak and that sort of thing. But this weird thing that we have nowadays that you're somehow like a slave of this geographic territory in which you live. I, I think this is this is artificial and it's incompatible with the digital age. So I fully expect that the system of of uh, passports and national borders and nationalism that is such a feature of the 20th century is going to eventually evaporate in the course of the 21st century. And how do, you, how do you expect this transition to take place? Then? Because right now governments have a lot of power and a lot of assets. Do you, you, you want governments to start selling those assets and start dismantling the power? you think it's an organic process or you think it will be more of a, a shock in a way? Yeah, I think it will be both. Uh, you know, people start misbehaving uh, enough and eventually states can't keep up with them anymore and then they adapt their laws to accommodate them. We're seeing this every day in the United States, you know, because we have... Uh, arcane laws governing every aspect of life, but uh, those laws are being eaten away uh, through peer-to-peer -peer, uh, technology in housing rentals and hotels and car rentals, uh, transportation services, offices, uh, professions. I mean, there's all these things that are happening every day through the app economy that are breaking down these old systems of regulation. That are that are that want to codify and control everything. I mean, like you can't control in the world anymore, and that's what's that's what's beautiful about it. And uh, I, I, what I see happening is that people first they get involved in peer-to-peer -to -peer technology because it works for them and makes for a better life. Uh, discover that it runs headlong into some government restriction. They're appalled and amazed by this. This grows and grows and grows, and eventually states adapt uh, to either just not enforce or to actually actively change their laws. So I see this as a feedback loop that's going to continue to unravel. So you think peer-to-peer uh, -peer technology uh, will uh, nibble away the state's power um, slowly but surely? Mm, it's already happening all around us. All around us. I mean, I see this in the U.S. all the time. Um, you know, 20 years ago, every city had a taxi monopoly, you know, uh, so that you could only ride with somebody who was licensed to drive you. You know, um, and and now that whole system has been blown apart. Really, in the course of like 18 months, it's been awesome to see it. And it's the same thing with like zoning regulations. Like I'm in Atlanta right now. Uh, anybody in Atlanta, if you have an extra room in your house, now can list that room on services like Airbnb, and you can turn your house into a hotel. Uh, well, this is a pretty amazing because it it. It goes against zoning laws and tax regulations and, and all these systems that have been constructed to prevent just this thing. But when governments are faced with something as, as amazing as peer-to-peer -peer te technology, uh, they eventually decide that the costs of enforcing these laws are too high, even for governments. So we're seeing this happen and thinking after thing. Even child labor laws are under pressure because so many... Like in the U.S., you can't really work at a job until you're 18 years old, which I, maybe that's amazing to you. I don't know, but I, I think it's disgusting. Um, like people should be allowed to work whatever age they want to. You know, why do we have these crazy laws? Um, but thanks to peer-to-peer -peer technology, now you see very intelligent young people at the age of 12 and 13 starting online businesses, uh, you know, even at a very young age. and. And if you're starting the business online, there's nothing that anybody can do to enforce child labor uh, legislation. And I think this is this is very good. So it's it's like happening uh, across every sector and every way. You know, it's touching every area of life. 
like the ability to sell goods and services. You know, like eBay has turned the the whole world into this global marketplace. You know, and um, uh, all these portals that allow you to work as a contractor. You know, now I can work for you. You can work for me. We can communicate directly. And we were having this video conference. You know, I mean, it's 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 awesome the way the advance of globalization and the and technology is really shattering a model for organizing uh, the world that emerged pretty much in the early part of the 20th century. But I don't think it can last under the current conditions uh, for very specific reasons, too. Uh, and it has to do with the fact that states really uh, only have two features to them. One is that they control only the physical world, and they can only do so geographically. So if you can come up with a new technology that evades the limitations of the physical world and exists outside the limitations of national geography, then you bust apart the system. And that's precisely what we're talking about with the digital uh, digital world and peer-to-peer -peer technology. It's digital, so it's weightless, it's spaceless, and it's, and it's truly global. Nowadays, in the app economy world, you download apps from anywhere, and you don't, you don't care where they're made. There's no protectionism on, on, app, on uh, mobile applications, for example, right? Like you pay probably extra premiums to for sugar and for corn or for pork or for ham, right, uh, yeah. or shoes, but uh, you're not paying uh, any protectionist um, premiums uh, on uh, on applications like you know AroundMe.com or or, or or you know Facebook instant messaging or anything. So yeah. the more the more goods are distributed in this format, the more things are available for, to be traded freely instead of protected. Would it be yeah. funny if there were import controls on something like Facebook instant messaging, so like you could only only download ten thousand copies in in Amsterdam? <laughs> you know? It'd be crazy, yeah. It'd be crazy, and people would say, "Well, that's insane," you know. Uh, Mr. Tucker. Yeah. Uh, but do you think that, um, like like a hammer, you can use technology for good and for bad? I can use my hammer as a mass mass murder of mass dis uh, uh, destruction. Yeah. Or I can use to pound in some nails, um, but likewise the government could uh, adopt something like a cryptocurrency and make it mandatory. So what's your, what's your take on that? Because that that sometimes bothers me because they can also use this new technology in a more sinister way. So have you have you given any thought about that? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, the one thing about governments is that they're much not nearly as smart as market. <clears throat> So markets are just naturally smarter and are better at doing things than governments. And consumers will always be in a position of choosing one or the other. I mean, people forget this, but back when email first came along, uh, the U United States Post Office thought that they would have their own system of email. And so they implemented this new system and, and expected everybody to go to a government office to get their email system. And they were certain that this would work because they thought that people would prefer the government system because it's more verifiable and, and official, you know? But it didn't work, right? They, they put out these machines. They tried to get everybody to get email addresses. There was talk that they would mandate this, but it just blew apart because they Yeah, couldn't. but the, the post office is not uh, funding political campaigns. The banks are, so... <laughs> when, the po when, when the post office goes overboard, well, the government will be like, okay, but if the, if the banks go overboard, well, I guess they will take steps in, in some way or the other. So Well, they're taking steps now. I mean, Bitcoin is, is a lot more regulated today than it was even a year and a half ago, you know? I mean, well, like two years ago, you could start a Bitcoin exchange in the U.S. with no restrictions. And then uh, the financial... Crimes Enforcement Network of the Department of Treasury implemented a one-page list of things you had to do if you wanted to become a Bitcoin exchange, and immediately hundreds of, of exchanges just went out of business. They said, we can't do this anymore. So it, they can cause a lot of damage, but I just don't believe that over the long run they're going to win the struggle. Uh, but do you think it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing then that um, banks and um, vested interests invest in Bitcoin companies right now? Like to, even today we saw it bit uh, a U.S. exchange to become fully regulated. We saw Goldman Sachs investing uh, earlier in Circle, and we also saw similar investments with, with Coinbase. Do you think it's a good development, or does it worry you? I, I think, well, I think it is a good development in many ways because 
anything that's a wonderful technology banks are going to want. I mean, they've been a little bit behind. I'm surprised it's taking them so long. And blockchain technology <coughs> and the money transmission services of Bitcoin are so much better than our existing system. I mean, I'm like, I don't know what it's like in Amsterdam, but in the United States, if I want to get money to a friend of mine, uh, like today, uh, it is extremely difficult. In fact, it's almost impossible, you know, uh, to do it directly. And even now, like if I want to send a check for $1,000 to a friend, the, all, the only real viable way is for me to go to my bank uh, interface on the web and ask them to write, a, you know, to write a check and mail it through the post office to them, and it arrives in their mailbox. I mean, that's like, I just did this yesterday. I mean, like, compared to Bitcoin, this is like a joke, you know? It's like 100 years old. It's ridiculous. Yeah, things are much better in Holland. Uh, we are yeah. in a way lucky that we have a, um, a, a very easy to use banking system, and people can pay instantly to each to each other. Instantly? But do you think do you think in, in the states that banks are then primarily interested in the technology behind uh, decentralized ledgers, and so they can uh, basically smoothen their interbank clearing, or do you think they're interested in the currency unit itself? No, they're not interested in the currency unit. They're interested in the interbank clearing. There's no question about that. But still, I think it's good because we need a better infrastructure to get the big banks behind it will lead to ever more development. And the fact is that the way Satoshi built uh, uh, Bitcoin, it's not possible for the blockchain to be separated from Bitcoin as a currency. These are really one and the same. So uh, it's going to be good for Bitcoin, I, 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 I believe. Uh, the other thing is that since Bitcoin is essentially an open source decentralized system, uh, all the investments that the big banks make in blockchain style technology can be taken by the private markets and be used in this open source world too. It's, it, they don't have to be exclusive of, of each other. And we all know the truth about the blockchain. I mean, once you live in that ecosystem, uh, you're, you're basically free to do what you want. Especially if you use anonymizing uh, plugins, you know, like Darkcoin and that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's not going to be any stopping this. Uh, but it, it's going to be a long process, right? I mean, it's going to take, you know, five to 20 years. But, but the important thing is that it's like an awesome innovation because, you know, before Bitcoin came along, nobody really knew an alternative to national currency. We didn't, we didn't even know it was possible to create a currency out of digits. Like, if you'd asked somebody 10 years ago, well, can this happen? I mean, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, can this happen? I would say, oh, no way. It'll never happen. Now we know it's possible, and that knowledge alone is is awesome because it gives a chance for us to uh, to escape the the uh, the prison of the nation state. One of the coolest things about Bitcoin to me is that it's it's a global currency, so you can really use it on a global basis without these constant conversions in and out of national currencies, and that's that makes it automatically more marketable to the whole world. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, also, to me, um, it opened my eyes as to um, like typically a lot of people think, well, currency that's the state's business or or maybe the banks or the combination. But through the use of Bitcoin, you you understand that that's a very important aspect of life that should not be dominated by the state, and that it's very not cool if people can do that on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. So if it works with money, it works for all sorts of other things as well, as we already see, of course, with housing and rights and all of that. So yeah. I tend to agree with you. It could usher in a, a new era of, 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 of a peer-to-peer -peer society where people just uh, work together without third parties. I agree. I completely agree. You're right about that. It's the experience of using it that's, that's so awesome. Like you can read about it, you know, uh, all the time in the papers or, or on Wikipedia or whatever. But, like, you don't really know how incredible it is until you actually own it and then transmit it. And then you get this, like, glimmer of the future. You know, you just, you feel yourself embedded in, in a world that's newly dawning. And it's, it's, it's amazing. Then when you go back to national currency, you're like, oh, you know, this is, this is terrible. <laughs> this is a terrible system. It can't possibly work. Well, I gave a... I gave a presentation last week for the Libertarian Party in Amsterdam. So, and about uh, five or six people showed up. So that's uh, it's a big turnout. It's, for yeah, <laughs> it's, it's it's good to stay with both feet on the ground, I guess. Because, um, but my, my question really was like, um, you're an anarchist, um, and how are the other anarchists are they 
picking it up, or it, it should be a, an anarchist wet dream, I guess, Bitcoin. In the U.S., it, it really is. In fact, in a way, people have exaggerated expectations for Bitcoin. Um, like they think it's going to be this magic thing that's going to get us immediately from where we are to where we want to be. Magic and, pill? Uh, yeah, and, and that's not true. It's, it's like the best tool I think human liberty has ever had. But that doesn't make it magical, right? It's still going to be a long time and a lot of struggles between here and there. Uh, so I'm worried about the transition. Like people have exaggerated expectations in the anarchist world for for getting from it. Like people think, for example, it's anonymous, right? It's not anonymous. <coughs> then people need to understand that. Um, but you know, a new world of freedom is not born and built like overnight. It's just that I think right now we have the best uh, the best tool we've ever had. I mean, the peer-to-peer -peer revolution has been going on for a long time, I would say maybe 10 or 15 years. But it wasn't until Bitcoin that we had a currency to use. I mean, you can't imagine a, a global economic revolution taking place without having a currency. Otherwise, we're always forever bartering services. And that's what goes on a lot of the time in the peer-to-peer -peer world. But now with this unit of account, uh, we have the thing that takes us from barter, you know, into civilization, and and now we have the infrastructure that can can build and build and build uh, and scale uh, across the globe. So we have all the pieces in place, and yeah. that's awesome. And the thing you just said about exaggeration, do you also blame yourself maybe on, on that regard? I oh, mean, I, I've, I've, also been, I've also been too positive in the past. Um, and fortunately, as some people listened in time and were able to to acquire Bitcoin at a very low price, but I sometimes think, yeah, I should have been maybe a little bit uh, more realistic, especially, let's say, in 2012 or 2013. Absolutely. I mean, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, it's uh, I look back at some of these things like, you know, I would give these talks, you know, just like I was just so excited about it, right? Yeah. It's going to end the nation state, you know, and there's, is, there's going to be no limit to everything, and I've and it was very exciting, and I was probably, in a sense, like overly exuberant in a way, because I gave the message, you know, that it was somehow going to be like, like a no-brainer, you know, like <laughs> the struggle is over, and and that's just I never intended to say that, but that's probably in many ways how I came across, just because I do think it's awesome, and I haven't changed my mind on that. But yeah, I I agree. I I, I bear some responsibility for that. Um, so we have quite a few questions from the audience, so let's, uh, let's go through a few of them. Uh, first of all, um, in, uh, from Hendrik Jan Hilbolling, uh, aren't the states replaced by multinationals like Google, Facebook, and Twitter? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I mean, once we, get, once we get rid of the state, we still have the problem of, of, of the corporate cartels, right? But, they, but these, these agencies, Google and, and Twitter and Facebook, have far less power in a world without intellectual property. And, and in a world where they're not being bolstered uh, in their bigness and, and their size and their scale by the states themselves. So uh, I think one of the reasons these, organ these corporations are so powerful is precisely because states are powerful. But yeah, this is another problem we have to deal with. I mean, we are not yet towards a peer-to-peer -to -peer world. We're just, we're just building it a little bit at a time. But yeah. I also worry that, yeah, I mean, things like, like, like Google, uh, they also have central points of failure. And what we really need to work towards and is a truly decentralized world uh, without enforcement of IP, without the regulations that, 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 that hobble competition. Yeah. So without the state, I, I think that they're going to have much less power. At least there'll be an opportunity for constant competition. A related question is um, from Tim Pastor. It's about IDs because right now we have passports from the state, right? It's a completely arbitrary thing because my wife, she's Ecuadorian, and it's very difficult for her to travel. It's a lovely lady, she's very smart, but she cannot travel easily because of being born in the wrong country. It's just a lottery, of course. It's very unfair. Uh, but then we can go maybe to a world where we world where we have IDs from Facebook and Google, which is still not ideal. So the next step would be decentralized ID systems. So uh, Tim's question is, what do you think of decentralized Bitcoin-related ID systems, and how are these going to help us to get rid of those made-up geographical borders? Oh, that's a really good question. I'm, I'm extremely excited about the use of blockchain in general for creating non-forgeable and immutable identity systems and uh, for processing transactions 
they're exchange related even apart from money so uh, and I know a lot of people are thinking and working hard on this topic and we're working our way towards that I mean I'm really excited about things like blockchain marriages right I mean I think that's really great if somebody wants to get married uh, why should you have to go crawling to the government you should just be able to get married on the blockchain I mean and I've done I guess now two blockchain weddings so, so uh, you are the blockchain priest basically <laughs> <laughs> I cry every time, <laughs> and I always try to catch the roses. Right? <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, so another question from Gillian Katgert. Uh, Jeffrey, let me ask you a question off topic somewhat. Ron Paul spoke many times in the power structure that actually runs the, the, the governments, so like the, the permanent state. What gives you hope that they will not shut down the internet? Okay, that's... Well, they, I mean, if the, if the internet shuts down, then the ruling class shuts down too. So it's not in their interest to shut down. The, I mean, everything collapses. You know, 100% of all financial transactions, and the world goes back to you know pre-modern times. So I, I don't think that that's a real danger. Um, I thought the question was was going to ask about my theory of the state. Uh, you know, by reference to Ron Paul. And I, I, I think this is a gigantically important question because I, I've spent years thinking about it. I used to think of the state as being uh, just politicians, and I realized that's not true. And then I thought it was like this thing that's completely exogenous, like a violent force that's always holding people down. And I realized that's not really true either. And my latest understanding of the state, uh, I feel like I've kind of become more sophisticated in my understanding. It really is uh, kind of like what the Marxists say. It's the, it's the violent tool used by the ruling class to create cartels and, and eliminate competition for its, its power. I think that's the essence of what the state is. The libertarians need to do a lot more work uh, to, to understand this. Do you know what Dewey said about the state? Sir? Uh, John Dewey? Yeah. He said it's a shadow cast on society by big business. Yeah, it's not entirely a uh, crazy analysis. The more I look into it, the more I'm shocked at the direct relationship between the, the violent means and the largest wealth holders and power holders in, among the ruling class. I mean, there, there really is a, a deep, uh, almost stable cooperative relationship that happens between the two. This is important because, because people on the left think of the state as being an extension of the people, right? So. So, like, if we want to have more equal distribution of wealth, we should give the state more power so they can equalize wealth and power and privilege. I mean, the problem is that that never, ever happens. I mean, once you give the state more power, the only people who benefit is the, the existing ruling class structure. That's, that's the way it works. And then on the right, people tend to think of, of the state as being something like uh, the realization of, of mob rule, you know, uh, like this is the state really is the rabble, uh, the have-nots organizing to take from the haves. I mean that's not true either. It actually is the existing uh, power holders and wealth holders in the social order organizing and conspiring to maintain their monopoly of control and power. That's that's what the essence of the state is, and neither the left nor the right fully un understands this. But it is potentially democratic. Uh, well, it's democratic in name. That's what's funny. I mean, like, it's very, int it's very advantageous for the ruling class to give the impression that everybody is participating in this great project of ruling ourselves. I mean, that's the purpose of elections. But do elections actually achieve uh, what we hope they will? Uh, like, like a revolution uh, of of who of what the kind of regimes we live under? Not really. I mean. At least in the U.S., the elections are mostly kind of silly. I mean, sometimes you can make a little bit of progress that way, but but mostly it's just uh, it's like a like a like a charade. You know, it's it's like a like a, a game we all play together. Yeah. But you, you're you're a friend of Rand Paul, aren't you, Jeffrey? Yes, I've I've known him since he was about 22 years old, and we used to hang out at backyard barbecues at, at Ron's house. So, so do you advise them not to run then, if if you don't, if, if you think it's all theater and, and you know, he's, he's not able to to change anything? Well, you know, it's funny. Rand would disagree with me on this point, and he thinks he believes that he can 
achieve something for the cause of human liberty by running for president. Um, I, I like to hope he is right, and all I can say is, is that I'm glad it's that he's doing it and not me. Uh, so, I, I mean, I have uh, extreme doubts that this is true, but he's very, very clever and very serious. So he thinks he's going to outsmart the system. Uh, that's what he believes. I you know, think all the, all the true believers will get flushed out in the primaries, I guess. Yeah, right. Well, we'll see. I mean, he's very clever and very popular, actually, I think, in Republican circles. Um, and, I mean, people say, do you support him? Well, I, I, I don't really... That's not my thing, right, to, like, support this politician or that politician. Not really. I kind of wish him the best, in a way. But the most I think he could probably do is decline to do really evil things, like go to war or something like that. Or maybe his presence will help break down and accelerate the decline of the nation state. I hope that's true. Um, but at some level, part of me dreads it also, because I, 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 he's a friend of mine, and I, I do worry that he's going to get eaten alive by, uh, by a ruling class structure that yeah. is very smart, very well-funded, and anybody who sets out to defeat it is uh, is going to be facing a very difficult time of it. Well, at least he's, he's pro cryptocurrency, so that's a good thing. So it will it will yeah. hopefully it will hopefully help um, the movement to grow further. Yeah, you know, it's very interesting because he's never. It's fascinating to me because, like you were saying earlier, you, you used to be really interested in the gold standard, you know, and I was too, right? Like I wrote my undergraduate uh, thesis on on the gold standard, and I've always loved gold as an idea, but, but like you and I and a handful of old people care about the gold standard, but it has absolutely no future, you know, in a technological world, especially in the presence of Bitcoin. So what so do you think of all these new, uh, new cryptocurrencies backed by, uh, by gold? That's also a question from uh, Gideon uh, again, uh, Jeffrey. Should Bitcoin not be backed by commodities like real estate, gold, silver, in other words, by hard assets to be a real alternative to other fiat money? I really look forward to, to getting your answer on that one. Yeah, I don't think that's impossible, but I, I do think that people need to understand that Bitcoin, as it currently exists, is backed by something extremely important and valuable in the same sense that Mises talked about, use value. It's backed by the extraordinary service of the blockchain. And people say, well, what the hell is that? Well, uh, the blockchain allows you to title and commodify bundle information bits and and transfer them almost instantly on a geographically non-contiguous basis in a way that's non-forgeable, non-reproducible, immutable, and immortal. Okay, that's never been possible in the whole history of the planet and the whole history of humanity. Nothing like this has been possible. So yeah, that's an unbelievable uh, value proposition, and the currency that enables that and makes that possible then absorbs the value that emerges out of that blockchain services. So it's different from gold, but it's probably more valuable than gold. In the so scheme of things. Mr. Tucker, to, uh, to wrap things up, um, you seem quite uh, embedded in the Bitcoin stuff, but you, you also do other things, I guess. I, I do. I, I'm, I work for Laissez Faire Books. I work for the Foundation for Economic Education. I, you sell I, a Bitcoin I, book? I have a book, um, Bitcoin book called, uh, uh, called uh, Bit by Bit, uh, How P2P is Free in the World. And it's all about all about Bitcoin, but I spend my days uh, trying to do many things. Like I work for the Foundation for Economic Education. We're in the throes of revolution. It's revolutionizing its real, digital real estate in big, massive ways. I also run Liberty.me, which is a social publishing platform for Liberty, and I do a lot of writing for Laissez Faire Books too. So I try to keep like. Uh, my feet in all these different worlds, you know, intellectual space, technology, you know, practical applied applications of liberty. So yeah, I'm trying to do a lot of different things, uh, but they all center on this one theme. Yeah. Okay, just just one uh, quick last question. Um, my favorite uh, money philosopher, he's uh, Andrew Goss. Maybe you heard of him. He's a gold guy, and uh, he states it's the it's the dollar's turn in a barrel soon. So the fair Fed will probably start raising interest rates. Uh, there's a lot of uh, disappointing quarterly reports coming out. Inflation is coming. What do you think this will do for Bitcoin? I think Bitcoin is the new safe haven. It's not gold. It's Bitcoin. 
And if the Fed really starts raising interest rates, then we could actually It'll go. Have to. Yeah, we'll have to go. We'll go to another recession. I don't actually worry about inflation that much, but in the case of a, of a genuine monetary uh, crisis, like we had in 2008, yeah, the Bitcoin exchange rate to the dollar in any case is, is I, I, I'm willing to believe that it's going to change directions and just take off. Uh, if uh, And it will not affect gold as much. I think Bitcoin is the new gold, and that's pretty obvious to me now. Okay, great. Okay, well, um, Jeffrey, um, I know we've already been talking more than half an hour, but I'm, I'm amazed about uh, you're so busy with so many things and, and you still sleep, I guess. And Do, do you have a, a partner or do you, are you in, in a relationship? Or? <laughs> well, uh, uh, yeah, that, yeah that's, well, that's a, that's, those are our, our, our big, uh, big questions. I, I do not sleep as much as I should, yeah. uh, for sure. Last night, in fact, I, I was lying in bed for three hours thinking about uh, technology. Uh, I get obsessed with things. So sometimes I have to knock myself out with a good glass of gin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I heard uh, Roger Ver, while he was um, reading up on Bitcoin, he was actually dehydrated after a few days because he stopped um, sleeping and eating and his, his girlfriend had to bring him to, uh, to the hospital. Even. I so. can believe this. I can believe this. I mean, really, I was lying because I'm... You know, I'm building out a new cloud structure for fee.org, which is an immensely complicated problem. We're, we're, we're building a new content management system out of an existing live site and tracking, tracking the progress of this, of this great new .NET planet we're building. So all night long, I just had code ro rolling around in my head. And oh. through architecture issues and uh, potential complications. And yeah, it's, uh, it's obsessive. I, yeah, I, yeah it's, it's obsessive and thrilling because look, I mean, look, all of us, uh, this generation of workers in the space, we're building the new world, you know? It's, uh, it's an awesome responsibility and, and incredibly exciting. So yeah, it's hard to sleep. <laughs> yeah, well, I admire your positivity and then of course also you always make sure to dress up perfectly like a gentleman. So keep it up, uh, Jeffrey. Thank you so much. And everyone should check out liberty.me and of course uh, Jeffrey Tucker on Twitter. And, and um, yeah, maybe we can do it again in the future. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was really great to be here. All the best, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.